You are welcome to my channel. Thanks for visiting. Remember to subscribe if you haven't. And if you have subscribed and you are visiting again, I appreciate that. Thanks also for remembering to share this presentation on your different platforms and for listening to this very one. Well. Today is about a big topic, but we are all familiar with it. That is heart failure. The heart is failing. The heart is failing. Not yet, now giving up completely. The heart is still working, but not working efficiently. The heart is failing. This is not heart attack. This is not cardiac arrest. The heart is still working, but not working efficiently. We need to know everything about heart failure. Okay, we're there right now. Let's go. Heart failure, like I've said, is a familiar topic. Today, we'll go into everything we're supposed to know about heart failure. Today, on heart failure, we'll go through a lot. We'll go through definitions of certain terms. Symptoms of heart failure, that is what the patient will talk about. Signs of heart failure, that's what the nurses and doctors will pick. Causes of heart failure or possible risk factors, we'll examine them. Diagnosis, how can we make accurate diagnosis of heart failure? We'll go through everything. What are the possible preventive measures? And how can we treat heart failure adequately and correctly? What are the possible differential diagnoses of heart failure? Many. If it is not heart failure, then what could it be? Have you heard about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or heart failure with pres preserved ejection fraction? In the old textbooks, we're going to find this as diastolic heart failure or systolic heart failure. How about prognosis when we're faced with heart failure using the left ventricular ejection fraction? And how can we classify heart failure? Drugs to be avoided will all be listed here. Drugs that we can use but we we'll use cautiously, we'll go through them. And of course, on that definition of terms, we'll get to a lot of stuff. Let's go. Now, the journey of a thousand miles will start with a step. Definition of certain terms. This will make it easier for us why we go through this journey? Before we start going through the medical jargons, let's look at this. These are blood vessels. I will go into all of them in a bit. And this is the heart. The heart itself has blood supply, right? Coronary arteries. Now, briefly, before We'll start talking about the abnormal situation. Let's go through the normal situation. Initially, I said the heart is failing. It's not heart attack. It's not cardiac arrest. Okay, normally. Used blood will come back to the right heart through superior vena cava from the head and the upper parts of the body and through a view of an cover from the lower parts of the body down inside the right atrium. There will be contraction. We will go through the forces that will be needed to do that in a bit. Contraction here will force the blood into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will contract and pump the blood into the pulmonary artery here. It is called an artery because it's taking the blood away from the heart. It is called pulmonary because it's related to the lungs. So the 
as deoxygenated blood will get into the lungs. Then, reactions will occur. Right here, the left side of the heart will have oxygenated blood. Pulmonary vein will pick the blood from the lungs. That is oxygenated blood. And down the content in the left atrium. The left atrium will contract the other setting conditions. And then the content will be pumped into the left ventricle. It depends on so many other factors like stiffness of the left ventricle that will determine how much the left ventricle will take and how you know, quickly the content is dumped and whether the atria will contract with full force. And then after the ventricle is filled, then the ventricle will contract, the left ventricle will contract and pump the blood through the aortic valve into the aorta. And these will also depend on certain factors. Aortic stenosis, pressure from the aorta, and that is afterload. Then the blood will go through the ascending aorta to the arch of the aorta, and all these will supply the head and neck region, descending the aorta you know, down and to the rest parts of the body. That is the normal situation. But in heart failure, there will be a lot of you know, factors along these parts that may not go as it is expected. Either enough blood is not even getting to these ventricles, or the ventricle is not taking enough, or not you know, uh, relaxing enough, or when enough is even dumped in the left ventricle, not in, in, enough is pumped out because of certain factors, and that is ejection fraction that could be reduced. So, you know, it's not getting to all organs, then what is happening? Tissue perfusion will suffer, and then we will know the heart is failing in its duty. Now, definition of times 40, the heart failure itself. Normally, like I've just explained, so I'm not wasting time right here. The right heart, that is the right atrium and the right ventricle, we receive blood returning in from the entire body through the superior vena cava, you no, know, from the upper part of the body, and inferior vena cava from the lower part of the body. Then, from the right atrium, the content will be pumped into the right ventricle and then into pulmonary artery and to the lungs, just as I've explained. Then, the left heart. That is, the left atrium and the left ventricle will receive oxygenated blood from the pulmonary vein. It is called vein because it's bringing blood into the heart, and it's called pulmonary because it returns to the lungs, and then into the aorta, heading to the entire body for tissue perfusion. When the heart is unable to pump blood efficiently to maintain this uh, uh, dynamic process, then we say the heart is failing. There is the possibility or probability of a left heart failure with bad flow into the lungs, causing what? Pulmonary congestion. We will go through the signs and symptoms of pulmonary congestion from left heart failure in a bit. The right heart failure will cause back flow into the peripheral circulation. Remember from my explanation, blood from the uh, superior vena cava and inferior vena cava will come to the right heart. So when the right heart is having trouble, the blood that is coming from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava to the right atrium will flow back to where is coming from. Then that will be causing edema, you no, know, pida, periorbital, edema dependent area, and so on, and enlargement of the liver and the spleen, hepatosplenomegaly. Now, 
for everyone, because my presentation is meant for everybody, not for medical students and nurses and doctors only, even anyone working along the street that could click on my channel will be able to understand the medical jargon. So here I've brought out you know, um, the prototype of the lungs, you know, showing what I meant by saying pulmonary congestion. So when the left heart fails, you know, the blood is expected to be coming from um, pulmonary veins from the lungs into the left heart, to the left atrium, right? When there is trouble and the blood flows back to the lungs, then the lungs will be filled with blood and becomes congested. Now, the other time I explained that when the right heart fails, then there will backflow to where the content in the right atrium has come from. And that will include, you know, peripheral edema, you know, periorbital, pida, dependent areas, and of course, enlarged spleen, splenomegaly, and a large liver. So this is the liver that will be in trouble. Now, there is what is known as preload and afterload. Okay, I will not waste your time to go through this fully again because I've just done that. When we talk about preload, this is the initial stretching of the cardiac muscle cells or Know, the medical jargon is known as the myocytes before the contraction of the ventricle. This is related to ventricular failing, meaning the preload is all about what is happening here. Okay, expectedly, the content from the left atrium is supposed to be downed in the left ventricle, but when there is ventricular you know, stiffness, uh, it is not stretching enough, so enough will not you know, be here before uh, contraction, and whatever is in the ventricle is where the ventricle will pump out. And of course, the fraction of it is expected to be high. In many cases of heart failure, it might be low. We'll go through that later on. Why afterload is all about after the ventricle did, you know, has been filled, what is happening? And that is going to be the force or the load that the heart will have to work against. You no, know, why you no? Know, the ventricular ejection is happening. So the the ventricle is expected to contract and pound the blood through this valve, aortic valve into the ascending aorta, to the descending, and to the arch of aorta, and descending aorta. But if there is very high pressure from here, or aortic stenosis, or long-standing hypertension, then there will be a problem. And of course, we expect the normal situation to work perfectly, and there will be no signs or symptoms of heart failure. Now, the left heart failure mostly will lead to the right heart failure. And when the both fail, we then have what is known as biventricular congestive heart failure, or simply put on a CHR, that is congestive heart failure or congestive cardiac failure. When we find CHF or CCF is all the same, is all talking about biventricular failure, meaning it's not only the right heart, it's not only the left heart, it's both hearts that are failing. There's another entity known as corpomonally, we'll talk about that in a bit. The systolic heart failure or systolic heart failure is also known as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction respectively. Left ventricular ejection fraction will be determined with the aid of echo. 
and that is the most significant prognostic factor when it comes to our failure. Let me repeat here that we cannot just you know, jump over the impotence of left ventricular ejection fraction. It is the most important prognostic factor in determining death in anyone with heart failure. The anotropes. Any agent that alters the force of muscular contraction or the energy is an anotrope. Positive anotropic agents will increase the force and strength of muscular contraction. I think we are getting that right. An example will include amine. Talking about positive anotropic agent right now will include prostaglandins and of course catecholamines. Let me pause a little bit here when it comes to catecholamines. The list of catecholamines will include dopamine, dobutamine, adrenaline. Adrenaline is adrenaline in Europe, but the name is epinephrine in North America. No adrenaline in Europe, no epinephrine in North America. Also, proterino and dopamine. Also included as examples of positive anotropic agent will include the jersey. We'll talk more about the jersey in a bit. Angiotensin 2, sulfodiesterase beta, merinon, and calcium. Let me talk more about calcium. Calcium has the power to regulate muscle contraction. When there is a high level of calcium, then we'll have a very strong and lasting muscular contraction. But when we have hypocalcemia, we're battling with weak and short muscular contractions. Calcium has the capability to also antagonize the cardiotoxic effects of hyperkalemia. Remember, if you go through my presentation on hyperkalemia, we will go for calcium gluconate at a particular level because we just don't treat all stages of hyperkalemia you know, the same way. It depends on the value of the potassium, right? So when it is becoming scary, we go for calcium gluconate to save the heart. Why that? Calcium will antagonize the cardiotoxic effects of excessive potassium, and that will cause stability of the cardiac cells against unwanted depolarization. So um, this is good in heart failure, okay? Particularly, uh, we run away from blocking the calcium because we need it here. Uh, but certain uh, calcium channel blockers will be helpful. Example would be amlodipine. Um, if there is heart failure associated with abtention or heart failure associated with angina. We can only use amlodipine. Some will use nifedipine, but amlodipine is better amongst the dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. But we are not going to use non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamine or ditazem. Never. Never. And even the amlodipine, that is the dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker that could be helpful, is only when that's heart failure with hypertension or heart failure with angina. So, positive anotropy agents are useful in congestive cardiac failure, cardiomyopathy, decompensated uh, congestive cardiac failure, shock, and so on. Still on anotropes, negative anotropic agents would decrease cardiac contractions and they may worsen the clinical state of anyone with congestive cardiac failure. And someone is excited to know them and run away right now. Okay. Examples here will include beta blockers, except three of them. Metoprolol is helpful. Carvedilol is helpful. Bisoprolol is also helpful. Okay. Non-dihydropyridine 
person channel blockers are neg negative and utopic agents. And the examples are Verapami and Ditarzan. So they are not welcome here. Okay. Also, class 1A anti arrhythmic agents and the class 1A anti arrhythmic agents will be procinamine, disopiramine, and quinidine. They are not welcome here. Class 1C will be flecanine. It's not welcome here. Negative anotropic agents could be useful in the face of angina pectoris which is a situation when we need to reduce cardiac workload to decrease the oxygen demand and reduce the pain. So, someone is having heart failure, also having angina pectoris. You remember, I've just said it a while ago that some will use and load the pain when there's heart failure with hypertension or angina. So, the beta blocker here will help a lot in this situation. Force of cardiac contraction. Remember, we've just gone through the anotrope, right? Mm -hmm. So, you can see the way the heart is beaten. The positive anotropic agents will help this force to be stronger, while the negative will weaken it. Now, chronotrophs. They change the heart rate. How could they do that? By increasing or decreasing the heart rate. They also change the rhythm. Why? Well, they alter whatever the sinoatrial node is produced. The positive chronotrophs example here will be atropine, meaning Atropine can increase the heart rate. Yes, that's it. Epinephrine or adrenaline would do. Yes. Negative chronotos include beta blockers and non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. They have the power to alter the rhythm and heart rate by altering whatever sinoatrial node has generated. So, sinoatrial node, rate, and rhythm. The reason why I put it here is that I want us to get this very clearly, that sinoatrial node is the heart pacemaker. That is where electrical impulse you know, of the heart is being generated from. And then it will travel around the entire myocardium. So, the rate and the rhythm. Is suspected to be detected no, from sinoatrial node, then gets into atrioventricular node. And the sinoatrial node is right here at the junction of the superior vena cava and the right atrium. That's where you're going to find sinoatrial node. Some literature will put it that it is inside the right atrium. Bromotropic agents. Here, they affect the speed of conduction in the atrioventricular node. Remember, we have just left the sinoatrial node right now, and then we are moving into atrioventricular node. So the speed inside there that will affect the force of ventricular contraction is being affected by dromotropic agents. So they influence the rate of electrical impulses in the heart. Positive dromotrophs will increase the conduction, for example, epinephrine, while negative dromotrophs will decrease the conduction, for example, vagal stimulation or non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, that is, berapamine or detalism. Badmotropic. This will modify the degree of excitability of the cardiac musculature when there is now stimulation. Meaning, when there is now stimulation to the cardiac muscle, that is to the myocardium, the level of uh, depolarization or excitability of the cardiac muscle can be modified by these agents. 
positive biotomotropic agent will increase the response to the stimulus. And that will include calcium, that is low level of it, hyperkalemia, digitalis, epinephrine, norepinephrine, mild apposite states, and ischemia. The reason why it is specifically stated that mild apposite states will be given a bit. Now, negative bathmotropic agents will increase the threshold for depolarization. When the threshold of any stimulus is increased, it means you need stronger impulse before you know, there could be any action. For example, if someone says, my pain threshold is very high. It means the individual will not feel pain so easily until you know, the stimulus or the impulse is pretty, pretty very painful. Why, when somebody says my threshold for pain is pretty low, means any little impulse, any little painful stimulus will lead to pain. So the same thing is happening here. Negative but neutropic agents will increase the threshold for depolarization, meaning stronger stimulus will be needed before the myocardial contraction can occur. So there must be stronger uh, impulse, firing and firing before we will see contraction. In that case, increased calcium could be responsible, propanolol could be responsible, apokalemia, aponatremia, and severe aposia. You could see the reason why the other time we said mild aposia will be positive but more tropic, but severe aposia will serve as negative or, yeah, negative but more tropic or an agent that will increase the threshold for depolarization. Now, signs and symptoms of our trailer. Signs are one the nurses and doctors will pick on physical examination. Why try to make you know, the diagnosis of heart failure? And also trying to classify the heart failure you know, into different categories. We'll go through all of them. Why symptoms are what the affected individuals will be passing through? That is what they are going to launch as complaints. You know, to the doctor. So this is where I'm feeling. Feeling this and this and this. Let's go through that. Heart failure signs and symptoms. It is necessary to know that signs and symptoms of heart failure are not rigid, but variable. Meaning, two people having heart failure may not pass through the same signs and symptoms. Okay? It depends on what is responsible for the heart failure in that individual and other concomitant you know, or comorbid conditions. Now, signs and symptoms of heart failure. Right heart failure. The reason why I brought them out separately is that it's not in everybody that we're going to find by ventricular you know, failure or congestive cardiac failure, no. Some will have only right heart failure, some will have only left heart failure, but people with left heart failure will eventually have right heart failure, okay? Left heart failure will mostly lead to right heart failure, then we'll be dealing with biventricular failure. In right heart failure, we'll likely be battling with, you know, backflow to the peripheral circulation. And there, we're going to find peripheral edema, periorbital edema, pedal edema, sacral edema, if the person is sitting down for a long time, then dependent edema and so on. Anyway, so also there'll be splenomegaly and hepatic congestion. Now, that it will be pointing to right heart failure. Left heart failure 
the individual is having back flow to the lungs, okay, and the left side failure. So there may be cough, hemoptysis, otopnea. I will explain what I mean by that later on. Paroxysma notiona dyspnea can all occur. And sometimes we'll find palpitation if the heart failure is related to atrial fibrillation or other arrhythmias. By ventricular, I've explained earlier that that means both the right and the left ventricles are underperforming. Okay? Then we have acute or subacute uh, presentation. If that is the case, there will be shortness of breath at rest or with exertion. With utopnea, paroxysmal nausea, dyspnea, and right upperchondrial discomfort or right upperchondrial pain in acute state. And as a matter of fact, it's an acute emergency. In chronic presentation, that might be in months. The presentation will occur in more like the name depicts. Here, there will be less dyspnea, there will be more fatigue. There could be anorexia, anorexia that will be from poor perfusion of the spawning circulation. And that will be associated with bowel edema, also with nausea, and of course, hepatic congestion. There may be abdominal distension. Of course, when there is hepatic congestion with ascites, then you will have abdominal distension, then edema everywhere. Now, excessive fluid accumulation in heart failure will present with shortness of breath, dyspnea, dyspnea on exertion, otopnea. Now, let me explain what I mean by otopnea here. Somebody lying flat and could break. Some people will even sleep face down, but don't allow children to do that. If they do that, there might be sudden infant death syndrome. But I've seen many adults that that's the way they sleep. That is not going to happen in that failure. Okay? It's not that you can you can lie flat, face down, or whatever, but somebody with heart failure and excessive fluid accumulation will have breathing difficulty while laying flat for a long time. Also, there's an entity known as paroxysmal notional dyspnea. In fact, I think the group of cardiologists should look for another name for us with paroxysmal notional dyspnea because what this is saying is that at night, hmm, breathing difficulty will occur when the affected person has laid down on the bed for a long time. But what if the person is laying down during the day, trying to sleep during the day? It might not be at night alone. That's why I said nocturna might not be, you know, uh, you know, utopnia and nocturna, personal nocturna, this being uh, uh, just two brothers that are pretty close. Then edema and everywhere, periopita, peri, you know, tibia, edema, hepatic congestion, Causing right upper chondrial pain. Yes, from back flow, right? When the right side has failed, or we are dealing with congestive cardiac failure or biventricular failure. Of course, ascites from the same purpose, leading to abdominal congestion or from excessive fluid accumulation. Now, I've brought liver here for us to understand what we've just said that back flow to this liver will then lead to enlargement of the liver, heptomegaly, then there will be ascites, then the abdomen will be swollen, or from backflow, from right heart failure, or left heart has failed, leading to right heart failure, by ventricular or congestive cardiac failure. Now, another condition that will give us signs and symptoms is decrease in cardiac output. If that is the case, no, maybe the left ventricular ejection fraction has dropped. Then there will be fatigue, and we understand that. Weakness, exercise intolerance, and the fatigue and weakness were associated with exertion. 
we understand that, right? Because when we want to exercise and there's decreased cardiac output, we will need oxygen, right? No, we need ATP no, into the muscle no, for energy, right? But how are we going to get the oxygen? It's from the blood that will be pumped to the muscle, right? Tissue perfusion. When legs is being pumped, legs will be supplied to the muscle. And then fatigue will set in. Lactic acidosis building up. And so on. Anorexia. The, the individual will no longer have you know, good diets anymore because they are not interested in eating because there will be poor perfusion of the spawning circulation. And that will be associated with bowel edema, nausea, anorexia, and hepatic congestion. So it's not their fault. It's because there is poor perfusion of the spawning circulation. Fatigue. The fatigue will be at rest. Even with minimal exertion, they become fatigued. They will not be able to carry out activities of daily living. Many will not be able to uh, bake themselves anymore. They will not be able to cover themselves, transport themselves, and so on, because they are just going to have this serious fatigue. Uh, when they have exercise testing, for sure, they are going to fail it. That is fatigue from heart failure. Palpitations. It's not everyone without failure that will come down with palpitations. The heart will be raising. And when that is the case, we should check out, grab our ECG or EKG machine and find out if there is a fibrillation or any other arrhythmia. But we can have complete blood count done. Even on physical examination, checking for capillary refill or pallor in conjunctiva or no, anywhere even from endoscopy will be better to detect anemia and complete blood counts will establish that. So when someone is having heart failure and is having the heart raising, that is palpitations, might be atrial fibrillation, might be anemia or any other arrhythmia. Swellings. Swellings will be pointing to right heart failure. It might be by ventricular failure. But if there is no left heart failure and you are finding pedal edema, perobital edema, sacral edema, pit edema, and JVP is raising, for sure there is right heart failure. I can bet anything for that. Okay, now in right heart failure with back flow to the peripheral circulation, we have the following pedal edema periorbital edema, sacral edema, pitting edema, and increased JVP on examination is simply telling us about abdominal jugular reflux. So some other literature will call it hepatojugular reflux. So swelling is going to be picked in congestive cardiac failure or right heart failure. Impaired mentation. A likelihood of decreased alertness, changes in mental status, and difficulty concentrating. Don't blame that grandpa. Don't blame that grandma that is having heart failure right now, and he or she appears not to be paying attention to you when you talk or not giving you, you no know, correct responses at you no know, appropriate space. Is not is a fault in pigmentation. It's already happened. Weight changes. Of course. In fact, in any establishment where people without failure will be managed, the weight scale must be on ground. The nausea and vomiting can lead to weight changes. Anorexia, they are not eating. Decreased appetite, loss of fat, decreased muscle size, they become cachycardic when the heart failure has reached a particular stage. And the massive edema, or before lysis is being used, can increase weight. Anemic okay. 
skin condition. Anemia can lead to heart failure. So if anemia is responsible for the heart failure or along the line, anemia uh, was not the cause, but anemia sets in along the line, then whichever part, your heart could be raised. There may be dizziness, lightheadedness, including chest pain. You see, I decided to put the image of the red blood cells here for us to understand anemia. Cough. Yeah. For the sputum was wide line supine, that is otopnia, associated with hemoptysis. This will happen in biventricular or left heart failure when there is backflow to the lungs with pulmonary congestion. Still on symptoms, rapid and irregular heartbeat will tell us we are dealing with atrial fibrillation. Do you know why this is important? Because this will help us to know that we will need anticoagulants or not, and then we will need you know, antiridmic agent, then rate control, you know, so that we'll be able to help appropriately. And then definitive management here could be electrophysiology. So that's why it's important that we know what we are dealing with. So EKG will give us the clue. Upper abdominal pain is telling us there's trouble with liver. But we must be careful. There may be other problems entirely as causing this ab abnormal you know, pain in the upper abdomen. The urination pattern may change. There may be more, you know, going to the washroom or toilets or joint the more frequently, nocturia at night, and some can actually you know, be having you know, accident, as we call it, you know, wetting the bed, and so on. Don't blame them. Don't be mad at them. Okay? No, it's not their fault. So, you know, are changing their lives and they need our help. Frequent falls. Particularly in the elderly, they fall more frequently because there's decrease in the level of consciousness. It's not their fault. They need our help. Now, I decided to put the image of the brain here because we talk about decreased level of consciousness. You, you see, you could see the number of images I put up now. The brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver. I should put uh, spleen there. I should have put kidney there. The entire intestine and so on. So, heart failure will affect all organs in the body. Now, signs. Signs are what the nurses and doctors will pay when the affected person presents before them. Carcass, the features of weight loss. You, you will see, particularly long standing heart failure, you will see they become carcass, you know. That may be cold and calming, you no know, periphery or extremities. That may be utopia. It can lie in supine for a long time. Dyspnea, tachypnea, central cyanosis or peripheral cyanosis. Because oxygen supply is impaired, the heart is in trouble. The lungs are filled with, you know, fluid, congested right now. And they may be swe uh, sweating profusely. There are forests. Still, part of the signs could be power. Remember, we've talked about anemia, that anemia could be responsible, or anemia could come up in the course of presentation and treatment when the heart failure is already long standing. Edema, pitting, pedal, sacra, or periorbital edema, the back flow, now the right heart failure, right? Pulsus alternus, mm -hmm. 
This is alternating strong and weak peripheral pulses. Could be pain. Irregularly irregular heartbeat. No good medical student, tell me what I'm talking about. Yes, you're right. Atrial fibrillation. Otosat would drop. Apical impulse could be displaced laterally in left ventricular hypertrophy, but not in all heart failure cases. There are certain situations that you will not see apical impulse being displaced. You will not later on. Because it's not in all heart cases that you are going to take chest x ray and you're going to find cardiomegaly. No. You will not today. Our jugular venous pressure could be elevated when we perform abdominal jugular reflux examination or some literature will put it a party you know, jugular reflux examination. So a part of jugular pressure will be positive. Still on signs, abdomenally could be picked. I'll show you the picture of the liver. Ascites, when there's a uh, party congestion. Jaundice, when the liver is in trouble and the liver function becomes impaired, not you know, uh, handling all these things properly anymore. Bleeding or bruises from hepatic failure, splenomegaly from backflow to the spleen, decreased blood pressure, crackles on lung auscultation when there is backflow to the lungs, you know, and of course, a narrow pulse. Still on signs of the heart failure, when you auscultate, you'll be looking for airstream gallop. And that could be picked in heli diastole at the end of the rapid diastolic failure. It is the most sensitive indicator of ventricular dysfunction. S3 gallop. Now, stages of heart failure. Class 1 heart failure means there is no limitation of physical exertion or activities of daily living. No one would like to have heart failure. But if that is the case, this is the best class you can have and still enjoy your life. You don't have any limitation of physical you know, activities, then you can bathe yourself, you can cook for yourself, you can drive yourself, do everything you do by yourself. That's class one. That may be angina pain when you have rigorous exertion for a long time. You can shovel snow, you can still do your gardening, you can participate in some sports, jog, and walk around. Uh, the individual affected that is under class one were very mind condition. I don't pray that anyone will have this, but this is the best condition that is amenable. If we know at this stage, we can quickly look for the cause and address it. Now, stage two. Here, the problem is already eating deeper into the affected person. They will not be as free as in class one to exercise as they wish. There will be slight limitation. But when they choose to rest, they will be comfortable. When they have uh, exertion, Unlike class one, when they have rigorous exertion before they have angina, they can have angina on mind exertion. They will be affected by cold. Walking more than two blocks will give them problem. Climbing more than one set of flight stairs will give them headache. Will give them problem rather. I meant whether I say headache, I meant trouble. Okay, so you can see class two is worse than class one. Oh, if someone is saying class two is bad, how about class three then? Class three means they will be comfortable at rest, but 
they can't tolerate any physical exertion. And channel symptoms will occur on any ordinary physical activity. Walking one or two blocks or climbing one flight of stairs will exacerbate their symptoms. So they are living maybe in uh, a kind of apartment building and they can't get to their you know, respective rooms through the elevator and they have to climb the stairs. On getting to their rooms, they've been in trouble. They can still do all activities of daily living so they can feed themselves. They can get up from bed, they can go to the toilet, they can bathe themselves and dress. Now class four. Nobody, nobody who wants to be here. They can't carry out any activity. Wow. Symptoms are present even when they are resting. So bad. And general pain will occur even when they are resting. Activities of daily living cannot be performed. They need someone to help them for everything. This is the moribund state. Wow. I feel for them. Now, what are the causes or what are the risk factors associated with that fail? You know why? If we know, and even you don't have heart failure, but you are listening to this presentation, then you want to work against the risk factors, and then you can, on your own, you now sit down and try to ruminate on what could be responsible for this heart failure in you. So let's go together. Heart failure causes or risk factors. Now, epidemiology of heart failure. And someone will ask me, why have you decided to bring epidemiology under causes and risk factors? Why not at the beginning of this presentation? Well, that is my answer. When we go through this epidemiology right now, we'll be able to understand why anyone should be suspicious or should be careful at a particular age or because you belong to a particular race. Let's go. Heart failure is found worldwide. About 20 to 25 million are affected. When you gather people that are 50 years old, if you are 1,000 of them, eight of them will have heart failure. Now, listen to this, please. When you gather people that are 80 years old, 60 of them, when you are 1,000 of such, 60 of them will have a failure. Compare that to age 58, age 80, 60. It means the older will become, the higher the probability of having a failure. It is more in blacks. The black man, and you are 80, and you are now going through signs and symptoms already listed, you are having a failure. Go and meet your doctor right away. Heart failure is not limited to blast, though it is more in blast, it is found in all. It's found in whites, in blacks, Hispanics, Latinos, Asians, natives, all over the world, all races, all known gender. Almost all ages are involved. It's only more in other people. We have children without failure. Yeah. It is either that story dysfunction or systolic dysfunction. In other words, preserve ejection fraction or reduce ejection fraction, preload or afterload. Still on causes or risk factors, why is it important to know the possible causes or risk factors? Well, the answer is not far-fetched. 
Knowing the risk will help us to work against the risk. You just go the opposite direction. For example, if smoking is responsible, then I don't smoke. If alcohol is responsible, then I don't boost. Okay? And when we know this, it will help us to slow down the rate of having heart failure in the population and probably decrease the severity because we'll be able to preach against it. We'll be able to no, converse against it. We'll be able to no, help people that do this, don't do this. If you do this, you're likely going to come down without failure. If you don't do this, that will help you out and so on. Then we should know that increase in age means there's increased likelihood or probability of having a failure. Now, the risk factors fully genetics. Like I've said earlier, that it might be commoner in blinds than other races, but that doesn't mean other races are exempted. No. Genetics. So if your father should come down with that failure, you better find out why. If you know the reason, then you work against it. If not, the chances of you coming down without failure is higher than the other friend of yours who has never had anyone in the lineage with heart failure. If there's coronary artery disease, yes, that's the most common cause of heart failure. Obtention, rheumatic valvular heart disease, myocardial infarction, that's part of coronary artery disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, myocarditis, ischemic heart disease, still myocardial infarction, arrhythmia. I've talked about atrial fibrillation, right? When the atrium is expected to contract and force the blood into the ventricle, that's not happening, it's just quivering. Then not enough is getting to the ventricle, not enough is getting to no, the body for tissue perfusion, and that is essentially the definition of a failure. Supraventricular tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, or atrial flutter. As a matter of fact, ventricular fibrillation will be the common cause of sudden death. We will go into that maybe. And when we are able to pick all this, we'll be able to work against this, we'll be able to know that we will use anticoagulant or not, depending on when we pick all these things. Still on risk factors, congenital heart defects, cardiomyopathy, idiopathic cardiomyopathy, peripartum cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, or ischemic cardiomyopathy secondary to macular infarction, common around in Western countries, and it's leading to systolic dysfunction. Still on risk factors, connective tissue disease, substance abuse. I have published on so many presentations on street drugs. The best thing is 100% abstinence. Don't do it, it's gonna kill you. Those are rubies we know where we use it. COPD. That is, chronic or surgery pulmonary disease is a long problem, right? Leading to core pulmonary, meaning the problem in the lungs is now leading to right heart failure. That is core pulmonary. Alcohol. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be boozing all the time. You're going to pay a price later on in life. Past heart failure might be responsible right now. And to those taking alcohol, please, I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what could lead to heart failure, please. Renal failure, yes. Tyrotoxicosis or hyperthyroidism is pretty close to atrial fibrillation in the sense that the rate of, you know, uh, contraction will be so fast that there'll be no enough time for you no, know, the ventricles to be probably failed before you know, they eject their content. 
Now, I've decided to put this here because I've mentioned the kidney. This is the kidney and this adrenal gland on top of it. This is ureter that is going to lead to the bladder and this is uretra that will move as it out. Still on risk factors, HIV infection, infiltrative disease like amyloidosis, diabetes mellitus. As a matter of fact, it was you know, said in those days when I was in medical school by our you know, endocrinologist that if you know diabetes when he was in school, uh, then you've known internal medicine. Diabetes affects you know, all parts of the body. I have a full presentation of diabetes mellitus already published by me. I will leave the link you know, under the description. Smoking, okay. Please develop strong aversion. No. Don't smoke. Don't smoke, please. Or if you are, please find a way to quit. You can start quitting gradually. Anemia. Yes. Let's find out what is causing because renal failure could lead to anemia. And I, I failure itself could lead to anemia because there will be anorexia. No, there will be nausea, there will be vomiting, the food is not taken down. In fact, you are not interested in eating, then you can have anemia. An anemia on its own can lead to a failure. Obesity, and when we don't know the cause, we have somewhere to hide in medicine. It will part. The diagnosis. How can we make the diagnosis of our failure? Is it going to be a big deal? Well, it shouldn't. Well, let's see. Heart failure could be diagnosed clinically, but do we need to do some other investigations? Well, in a bit, let's see. Okay, diagnosis one. I tag this diagnosis one because that is the first investigations that I would do if I have to carry out any investigation at all as far as heart failure is concerned. And that is brain natriuretic peptide. Diagnosis with brain natriuretic peptide. Although, truth be told, with Good history taking and thorough physical examination, we can clinically make the diagnosis of our failure. But for accuracy and for medical legal reasons, we might do a lot of other stuff per, as per investigations. So we can head to the lab or have radiological investigations done. Right now. Is all about brain natriuretic peptide, the diagnosis of heart failure. Okay, brain natriuretic peptide initially in the brain from the heart chambers, that is the ventricles and blood vessels, is increased in heart failure and left ventricular dysfunction. The atrial natriuretic peptide is from the atria, just as the name depicts right and the left atrium. Sometimes from ventricular apertrophy and it's also increasing heart failure and left ventricular dysfunction. The function of BMP and ANP. They are is in nature, both of them. Natriuretic meaning they have the capability of excreting sodium. You can when there is sodium excretion in urine, then there will be drop in blood pressure. BMP will protect the heart against progressive failure. So when we find it in heart failure, that you know, means loss. The brain natriuretic peptide is hormone that's released from the ventricles. The values will increase with age, normally. 
Let me explain. The older will become the higher the value of BMP. So we will interpret the values of BMP cautiously. Values are higher than women. Even when a man and a woman, you no, know, and in the elderly age group, we should still be careful. In women, the values of BMP will be expected to be higher than what we're going to pick in men of the same age group. Anti pro BNP is N terminal pro hormone brain anti peptide. Both BNP and the anti pro BNP are released in response to changes in our chambers from failure or from any fibrillation, either atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation, ventricular arrhythmia generally. Okay, BNP anti-pro-BNP. BNP in heart failure is greater than 400 picogram per ml. Many. In heart failure, before you can say this is heart failure, you will see BNP that is 400 and greater before you can think of heart failure. Anti-pro-BNP in heart failure will take different shape you will see anti pro BMP 450 picogram per ml in anyone less than 50 years old before you can say this is at failure. And the same anti pro BMP must be 900 pg per ml in anyone 60 to 70 years old before you can say you are dealing with that failure in him or her. And it should be 1800 pg, that is picogram per ml in anyone greater than 75 years before you can call it a failure. If BNP is between 100 and 400 pg per ml, you will need more tests before you can say that this is a failure. But if BNP is less than 100 pg, you are comfortable to say definitively that this is not a failure. If anti pro BMP is below 300 picogram per ml, then you can confidently say this is not a failure. Higher values can give a likely clue to heart failure, but higher values cannot rule out other associated conditions that can cause dyspnea. That might be pneumonia or pulmonary embolism and so on. While on treatment, we will expect the value of BMP or anti pro BMP to be dropping. But don't be surprised, it may not be so. Higher values will be expected in the face of renal failure, pulmonary embolism or pulmonary abstention. This near due to carpal pulmonary, meaning lung disease that is causing right heart failure. If that is the case, the value of BMP will rise. But it is not left heart failure yet. Meaning, BMP is high. Check. If there is no left heart failure, are we dealing with carpal pulmonary? So, this person has COPD. And now BMP value is high, and there's no pulmonary embolism. So what is going on? It is right at failure. BMP are lower in obese individuals or overweight people, but you still have a way out. And why that? Anti pro BMP are less affected by obesity or overweight. So. In someone with obesity or overweight, you may care less about the value of BMP. Go for and do very carefully anti pro BMP and get that right. BMP will be higher in the face of sepsis. So, someone has a seeming shock and the value of BMP is high? Yes.
It is expected so. Use anti pro BMP values to judge whether there's heart failure or not if the patient is taking sacrobutry or entrasto containing sacrobutry. Sacrobutry is a nephrilizing inhibitor. It will not affect the value of anti pro BMP. So we have two situations right now, or three, where and when BMP value would not really help us, but anti pro BMP values will help. One, in obesity, in overweight, in someone taking sacrobutry or taking entrusto. Why that? Particularly with sacrobutry. Sacrobutry will cause inhibition of BMP destruction. And when BMP is not destroyed, the level of BMP will increase. So we will not get the true picture. Note the above two points in anyone taking interest. BMP values are higher than heart failure will reduce ejection fraction. When you compare that to anyone with heart failure will preserve ejection fraction. So this might be a clue that you are dealing with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If you have your equal and you have lead ventricular ejection fraction down, it's likely going to be low when the value of BMP is pretty high. If you desire to determine the efficacy of heart failure treatment, then we need to have serial serum measurement of BMP, not a single measurement. Heart failure with symptoms is not the guarantee that BMP or anti-pro-BMP will be high. Some may have no symptoms at all, yet they have higher values, particularly younger age group people. And why that? Because they are young, they are stable, no ischemia is going on right now, and no cardiomyopathy. So, some may have no symptoms, have higher values of BMP, meaning they have heart failure. It's only that they don't have the signs and symptoms yet. The BMP is already telling you something is happening with the chambers, and it's not right. I bet what I'm saying here is that they don't have the signs and symptoms because they are young, because they are stable, because there's no myocardial infarction going on right now, and they don't have any cardiomyopathy. That is why their BMP decide truly they have heart failure, but they are not having symptoms, they are not having signs yet. Uses of BMP in the heart failure, in cardiomyopathy, in atrial fibrillation, in carbomonally, in atrocycling chemotherapy, pulmonary embolism, pneumonia, pulmonary hypertension, all these conditions can give dyspnea. Then looking for the value of BMP is welcome here. Still on uses of BMP, very helpful in left ventricular dysfunction, in renal failure, in anyone taking interest to, but we will interpret that cautiously because interest to will contain sacrobutry that will inhibit the destruction of BMP, then allowing BMP to build up. So the value may not, you know, correspond to the level of severity of the heart failure in anyone taking interest to. In that case, we go for anti pro BMP. Values. Must also consider the age. The older we become, the higher the value of BMP. And also consider the gender. Is more or is higher in women. And of course, body mass index. The value is low in obese and overweight. But the value of anti pro BMP is not affected by obesity or weight. Just as that will not be the case in a trust meaning 
the value of NT pro BNP is not affected by interest. So while interpreting the values, put it aside the age, the gender, the BMI, the overweight, and the interest. Helpful is classification of heart failure of patients. In determination of admission, value of BMP or entry pro BMP will help. In determination of discharge, yes, value of BMP will help. It is a strong predictor of death in heart failure. You can see the reason why I've decided to make use of this first before going to other forms of investigations in heart failure. Because once we're able to make that determination that we might not be able to cross the bridge, then we'll know what to do without wasting the money for the affected individual. BMP of life is four hours. NT pro BMP of life is 72 hours. Now, heart failure diagnosis, step two. I'm done with step one. All about BNP and NT pro BNP. Now, what do I have left that I could do in making accurate diagnosis of heart failure? Let's go. Heart failure is mostly diagnosed clinically. For accuracy purposes, we do all the following investigation, including BMP and anti pro BMP already discussed. Also, for monitoring, we do the following. Laboratory diagnosis. To rule out myocardial infarction, we can have troponin T and troponin R. C can be LDH. To rule out anemia, we can have complete blood count down. Why done? Anemia might be the cause of this very heart failure, or anemia, though, has become the case right now because of the heart failure. So, heart failure can cause anemia, anemia can cause heart failure by duration. Renal pathology. We can have urinalysis done because renal failure might be responsible for the heart failure. Okay? So we have urinalysis done, blood, urea, nitrogen, and kidney. Let's have electrolyte, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium done. Liver pathology. Remember, we said there will be trouble with the spleen, the liver, and then no peripheral you know, parts of the body when there's right heart failure because there'll be bad flow to the portal system and um, so on. Okay? So, when there's jaundice, bleeding, ascites, we want to know what is happening to the liver. So, liver function tests will be done. And of course, liver enzymes. So PT or NL, APTT, bilirubin albumin, glucose, all pointing to liver function test. Why liver enzymes will also be done? AST, ALT, GGT. GGT, if it is greater than twice the normal value, then we know we are running into trouble. GGT will add lots of value to diagnosis of heart failure and congestion with BMP, AMP, and NT pro BNP. So, is this near to you? Really? Okay, just grab it. GGT, if it's greater than twice the normal value, and you are getting a normal value with BMP, AMP, and pro BMP, then you're on the right track to make accurate diagnosis of this very, very horrible condition called heart failure. In diabetes, while burning ourselves about diabetes, we know diabetes could be the cause. So, we have random blood sugar done, and if it is diagnostic, fine. If it's not, we are fasting blood sugar down. 
You just want to be sure. And of course, urinalysis will help. But urinalysis is not diagnostic when it comes to diabetes. That will give us a clue. We set us a motion. Okay, why that? Transport maxima of glucose might give us a level of glucose in your rank. And when that is the case, somebody has just got you know, a can or a bottle of Coke or Pepsi, and then you do the analysis some few hours after, and then you find glucose. I don't believe that. Because transport maximum might be the problem when the person is not actually diabetic. So, urinalysis is not diagnostic fully when it comes to diabetes mellitus. But first up blood sugar can, right up blood sugar can give us a clue and so does a much. Infection, viral culture, remember HIV could be responsible, right? Polymerase chain reaction, enzyme link, immunosorbent assay, all this could be done to screen for HIV and of course blood culture. Hyperlipidemia, fasting lipid profile will give us the parameter we want on lipid, lipid profile. Still on laboratory investigations in heart failure, Ongoing inflammatory process by marker like seriatic protein, tumor, necrosis factor, procalcitony, and adipokin. Now, autoimmune conditions. We want to read it out, right? So, HLA, antinuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, antiphospholipid antibodies, and antisetomia, and so on. Other biomarkers will include stress on the myocardium. In that case, you can have natriuretic peptides down. If you want to find out myocardial insults, you can have troponins, you no know, I and T, and pentrazine 3 done. If you want to know what's happening as per neural hormones, you can have renin. Endotelin and angiotensin 2 acid. If it's about oxidative stress, you can have oxidized LDL level and myeloperoxidase. If you are worried about vascular system, you can ask it for homocysteine and adiponectin. Lithologically, we should have EKG done. In fact, we must have EKG done because we want to know if we are dealing with atrial fibrillation or not. Do you know why? It's going to affect the treatment, okay? Because we might need anticoagulants here. We might need medications to stop the rate, rate control. We might need anti, you know, arrhythmic agent here to correct the rhythm. Then we might have ventricular, tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation when we're dealing with this. We know we're in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. Because we might go for implantable cardiovascular defibrillator right away. Is it atrial flow? Is it supraventricular tachycardia? Then no specific features of pulmonary embolism on EKG. Well, my point to pulmonary embolism, but it is non-specific. Then. Still on radiological investigation, we can have chest x-ray done. Cardiomegaly is expected, but not in all cases. When, when can we have heart failure without cardiomegaly? Are you supplying the answer? Okay, don't worry. We'll get there in a bit. So cardiomegaly is expected, but not in all cases. And there could be heart failure, but no cardiomegaly. Can it be lines, pleural effusion? Echo could be two-dimensional, echo thoracic or transosophageal, depending on what you are targeting, what you really want to pay. So when we have echo done, we do need to get valvular heart defects, left ventricular ejection fraction that would predict the mortality in this particular patient. Once you know if you are dealing with cardiomyopathy, ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, cardiac output estimation, cardiac tamponin, constrictive pericarditis, 
Dalita Kaduma, your party or Etra enlargement. Exercise testing. This is not for diagnosis at onset, but for determining the level of functionality and then distinguishing pulmonary from cardiovascular causes of the heart failure, and also know whether or not cardiac transplantation will be suggested. And of course, an acute coronary syndrome. If that is what you are querying, you can have exercise testing done. Now, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So now we are going to, you know, a different class of heart failure. There's heart failure and there's reduced ejection fraction. We are in trouble. Okay, let's find out what's going on and how we can, you know, salvage this. Now, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. From this nomenclature, anyone in grade one can take a guess that the affected person is not getting enough supply to all the tissues. So, tissue perfusion impairment is occurring. The fraction that is ejected is low. Then, there's a serious problem. We must ask fast. Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. The heart is failing either because there's impaired filling of the ventricles or there's impaired ejection. But either way, there's decreased tissue perfusion. Many things are involved. Neurohumoral changes, structural factors, and functional factors. Now, Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a form of acute systolic heart failure, and if that is the case, it's a medical emergency. That will be characterized with chest pain, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, and other signs and symptoms. Medical emergency. It is acute systolic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Generally, when we are dealing with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, it's either a systolic dysfunction, that is the ventricle can't contract well, or diastolic dysfunction, the ventricle can't feel well. Causes here will include alcohol, drug abuse, abstention, arrhythmias, sleep apnea, myocarditis, valvular heart diseases, cardiomyopathy, and certain medications. The left ventricular dysfunction is defined by the value of left ventricular ejection fraction. Normally, people who are without heart failure will have left ventricular ejection fraction that is greater than 50 to 70 percent. Some, some 50 percent will have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction that is less than or equal to 40 percent, and that's pretty bad. The rest will have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So the reduced ejection fraction will have less than or equal to 40 percent, but those with preserved Ejection fraction will have greater than 50%, and those with minimal reduction in ejection fraction will have between 41 to 49%. When it is less than 40, it is fully reduced ejection fraction. Okay? When left ventricular ejection fraction is low, don't seek causes outside what is already uh, causing the problem. So it is going to be caused by any factor that is responsible for that very heart failure. Finally, left ventricular ejection fraction is a strong factor to predict the prognosis in heart failure. Now, let's get into the heart proper and find out why on earth 
Will anyone have heart failure and still have reduced ejection fraction? There are three factors that we want to consider here that can determine ventricular function. And when we have problem with any of these or all, then we have problem with ventricular function. Number one, the preload. From the name, pre, okay? The veins will return the content to the ventricle through the atrium. Then the end diastolic volume, how much volume do we, do we have after the diastole? Then how about the ventricular filling? How about the initial stretching of the myocytes? All these will constitute preload. So when there's problem here, there will be problem with you know, ejection fraction. Okay? Myocardial contractility. That is the force generated at the end of diastolic volume, preparing for ejection. Okay, now afterload is aortic impedance and wall stress, the aortic pressure that the ventricle must work against. So, let me explain myself. Before we can get ejection fraction, we are talking about fraction of something. There must be a volume in the ventricle before we talk about the fraction that is being ejected, right? Before we get that volume in the ventricle, there must be a return to the ventricle. Then the preload it will be telling us everything about the filling of the ventricle and the stretching of the myocytes. So if there is stiffness and there will be no room for stretching and there's no enough coming to the ventricle, we can you know, accurately predict what the ejection fraction is likely going to be. Then the myocardial contractility is when there is filling of the ventricle already hmm, at the end of the diastole, then how much of the force is generated for the next action, which is contraction and then ejecting the blood. Okay, now, you got this right, good end diastolic volume, ventricular filling nice, initial stretching of myocyte adequate from good venous return, great. Good force is generated, preparing for the good job of ejecting the content. But, unfortunately, there is a problem after load. You've already loaded, now there's another problem. The problem is what's happening at the level of LT valve. What is happening from the aorta? Any pressure you know, being mounted against ejection? So aortic impedance, wall stress, aortic pressure, you no, know, all these will be the forces that the ventricle will have to work against. If this is high, we will not get enough or good fraction of the contents of the ventricle that will be ejected. Medications like epinephrine and norepinephrine will affect. With increased intracellular calcium, there will be increased contraction. When you use beta blockers, you decrease the force and length of slope. Then, decreased cardiac output means there will be increased sympathetic activity. And when that is the case, there will be increased heart rate, and the increased heart rate will lead to increased cardiac output. Also, decreased cardiac output can lead to increased salt and water retention. And when that is the case, there will be increase in blood volume. Then that will lead to increase the stolic volume and pressure. How can we treat heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? We can use diuretics. And Trastol will contain Vasitine, that is a utensin receptor blocker, with Sacubitri, that is an epilysine beta. Remember, I've alluded to the fact that Sacubitri has the capability of preventing BMP distortion. Villa blockers, here we'll be making use of Cavedilor or Metoprolol. AC inhibitors, nitrate, evabradine for heart failure with decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, 
less than 35 percent still on treatment if we are not winning with what we've gone through on previous slide then we can increase loop diuretics to handle the fluid with metolazone with or without spironolactone i'll talk more on the situation where we use spironolactone and potassium the bit even with AC beaters and the rest. Then we can have fluid restriction to be limited to two liters per day. And of course, we have to restrict sodium intake to two to two, three grams per day. Hemodialysis may be embarked upon if all these measures, including what we've done on the previous slide, are not, you know, bringing the situation back. So, we are back on hemodialysis if all the above measures should fail. If there's apodetrimia, we can use vasopressin antagonists, for example, tovapta. This will improve urine flow without losing much sodium. Don't use it for a long time, please, and not more than 30 days if I told you how to use it. With that, there may be hepatotoxicity. We can have implantable cardiovascular defibrillator, cardiac transplant, or ultrafiltration. We can also use intravenous vasodilator like nitroprusa or nitroglycerin. Intravenous adenotrophs, they can increase the force of contraction, for example, dobutamine, if we are dealing with decreased blood pressure or renal failure. We use dobutamine. If there is a potential, we cannot use male renal. But if there's no hypotension, we can use male renal. And we can use pyora anotrophs like digoxin. The left ventricular assist devices like VED, you know, LVAD, intraaortic balloon pump, and candida transplantation and also be a back upon. So that is the end of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Implantable cardiovascular defibrillator will be pretty helpful. Then intraaortic balloon pump could be helpful. And the best would be cardiac transplant. The next would be heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Many, there's heart failure, but ejection fraction is still within the variable level or within the normal range. So, life is still better compared to the other type of patient we've just gone through that will have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So what is the main advantage or what is this all about? Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Let's go. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is preserved. It is not low. It is not reduced. The heart failure will preserve ejection fraction was formerly known as diastolic heart failure. If you check some literature today, you'll still gonna find it so. Here, there will be left ventricular wall stiffness, and the left ventricle cannot fit properly in diastole. 50% of all patients with heart failure will have preserved ejection fraction. This is pretty common in elderly people and females. Here, there will be stiffness in the left ventricle, leading to decreased compliance. Then, there will be increased feeling pressure, leading to increased left atrium volume and increased pressure. These will all together lead to increased pulmonary congestion. And then, the affected person will come down with cough. No, hemolysis, utopnia, paroxysmal nausea and dyspnea, and with time, right at failure. 
So investigations here is generally like in the previous presentations on the diagnosis. So you can pause and rewind back. Then when we have physical examination done, anyone with heart failure that is having preserved ejection fraction will likely have sustained APS B. Remember, ventricular stiffness, ventricular hypertrophy. You can have increased blood pressure, you can have trailer leaf. There have been no displacements of the APS B. Remember, the other time when I was going through the signs and symptoms of heart failure, I've said there might be displaced APS B, but I said not in all conditions. Now, this is the condition where and when the APS B would not be displaced. So you can pick S1, S2, S4 with or without S3. The investigation will also go further if you have chest x ray done, no cardiomega. No cardiomegaly. Can have your EKG done? Stress testing. EKG means ECG in Europe. EKG in North America. Can have your electrophysiology study done and blood test. When ECO is done, you are going to pick left ventricular hypertrophy. And the left ventricular ejection fraction will be within the normal range. Hence, the name will tally as preserved ejection fraction had High output heart failure is called so because there is a very high cardiac output and there is a decreased systemic vascular resistance. It can lead to decompensation. It can aggravate the assisting heart failure. There may be increased metabolic demand with associated increased oxygen consumption. Here, you might be battling with borderline preserved ejection fraction. Borderline preserved ejection fraction, I repeat, with increased filling pressures, decreased systemic blood pressure. It can't cause heart failure alone. But once we have it, we must look for the real cause or causes if it is symptomatic. The etiology of high output heart failure will include hypothyroidism. It's a venous fistula, left to right shunting, Parkinson's disease, renal disease, hepatic disease, very, very old time deficiency, anemia, or pregnancy. The hyperdynamic state, generally. Can be acromegaly, chronic pulmonary disease, sepsis. Carcinoid syndrome, traumatic atrovenous fistula, obesity, dialysis, myeloproliferative disorders. Might be exercise, fever, emotional stress, hot weather, and pregnancy is repeating itself. Did I do that on purpose? Absolutely not. The clinical features will be the same like the clinical features already presented, so you can pause and rewind back. But here, there will be no cold and climbing extremities. The extremities will be warm and well perfused in high output heart failure. You can see through this journey, we're seeing some clear cut differences, like in diastolic heart failure or Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, no cardiomegaly, 
no displays APS B. Now we could see in high output ad failure that there will be no cold and clammy extremities. Rather, we'll be having warm and warm perfused extremities. The ad trade will be increased, the stroke volume will be increased. Remember, I said I output that failure will be you know, in individuals with hyperdynamic state. So the pause will be bonding, then can collapse very really rapidly. There may be wide pause pressure, capillary pulsations, pistol shot sign at the femoral arteries, carotid bruise, venous home, and hyperdynamic precordium. The suspicious of high output heart failure in patients with features of heart failure, but were perfused and warm extremities. So be suspicious that that is ongoing. Also, having cardiac output greater than 8 liter per minute, but with signs and symptoms of heart failure, then be suspicious of heart failure with high output. The heart is failing but the output is still very high. So not exactly the same with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Do all lab or radiological investigations and then look for the cause or causes, please. The treatment is generally the same. So I'll go into treatment in a bit. So it's the same, but we must look for and treat the underlying cause or causes. The next presentation will be on acute decompensation of heart failure. Acute decompensated heart failure. Acute decompensated heart failure. This means that there is a sudden deterioration or worsening of the symptoms of heart failure and sometimes could be misdiagnosed as a respiratory pathology without adequate history and knowledge of the heart failure diagnosis in the affected individual. Acute decompensated heart failure. This is pretty common, but could be fatal. What are the clinical features of acute decompensation? Shortness of breath, suddenly. Paracysma, notional dyspnea, otopia, tachypnea, tachycardia, crackles or rates from pulmonary congestion, wheezing. The wheezing here is not due to pulmonary asthma, but due to cardiac asthma, because it has symptoms of bronchial asthma, though it is due to congestive cardiac failure. Massive edema or massive ascites with abdominal distension. There will be increased blood pressure. Decreased blood pressure could be the case in severe cases with increased jugular venous pressure and hepatojugular reflux or abdominal jugular reflux. Estric gallop and there will be cardiac arrest and death. Well, the possible differential diagnosis here might be pulmonary embolism, could be asthma, acute respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, pericardial tamponade, constrictive pericarditis or tension pneumothorax. Investigations that could be embarked upon include cardiac enzymes, estroponin, CKMB, complete blood count, arterial blood gases, renal function test, liver function test, BMP, NT, pro-BMP, to be sure it is cardiogenic. We have electrolyzed on sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, magnesium, calcium, can have our echo and EKG. The treatment. First thing first, airway. So we check the airway for any foreign body, any secretion, suction as appropriate, and make sure it is patent. Then, the breathing. 
central cyanosis, peripheral cyanosis, respiratory distress, failing of other nasal, accessory respiratory muscles, now chest moving with the abdomen, any obvious deformity in the chest or neck region, trachea deviation, and of course, breast sounds, decrease or not, crackles or not. And then, what is the O2 size? What is the respiratory rate? The circulatory system, over the fluid, any dehydration, no skin toggle, about anemia, capillary refill, what the heart signs saying? S1, S2, S3, S4, S3, gallop, momo, or not. Then fluid in and out, retaining in or not. We know the weight about you now peripheral edema. What are the vital signs? What's the blood pressure? What's the heart rate? You know all this. And then we hook up the cardiac monitor. Then O2 side, and then we we'll give oxygen if it's less than 92%. Blood pressure, the heart rate, respiratory rate, the temperature, and positioning. You now, have to sit up at angle 45 degree. Then IV lines, not to be rushing the fluid, you no, know, because we need to give intravenous medications, and then you no know, keep the vent open or give maintenance. You no know, CPAP or BiPAP. Or this A two minute for rapid sequence induction. This is intravenously arterial to 60 milligram. If there's a trifibrillation, we can synchronize, not having synchronized cardiovascular with digocene and warfarin. Nitroprusside for severe abstention, nitroglycerin to relieve dyspnea. If the left ventricular ejection fraction is less, you can give the butamine, and then remove beta blockers. If preserved, you know, ejection fraction, heart failure, or diastolic heart failure, then beta blockers should be used cautiously. Please, have a free vasopressor like, you know, phenylephrine or norepinephrine. No dobutamine here. No mineral, no nitroglycerin. You can do a cold do EKG. Surgery for mitra aortic degurgitation or aortic dissection. Intra aortic balloon. Then consult a cardiologist. Acute exacerbation precipitant. Meaning there's acute exacerbation. And we want to know what is responsible. For that. Heart failure acute as a basin. Okay, precipitants of acute as a basin will include new myocardial infarction, new arrhythmia, valvular heart disease, new hypertension, new anemia, new teratosicosis. Infection that is coming of first time and diabetes mellitus that was not known before. Acute exacerbation could also be precipitated by new problem with medications by failing to take medications. Now this is a no serious issue. Some don't have money to buy the medications. Some do. They have medications, but they have some other concomitant morbidity know that will not you know, uh, allow them to take medications appropriately like somebody having dementia or depression, okay, or somebody that has been abused. New problem with increased salt intake, you now some will be advised not to take in, uh, salt, but then once the doctor goes away or the nurse turns back, they are there taking the salt. Well, uh, you are hurting the doctor, you are hurting the nurses because they are not succeeding, but you are hurting yourself the more because they are not getting out of the problem. New problem with obstructive sleep apnea, new diagnosis of right heart disease, failure to exercise, now having renal disease or now having liver disease. 
then citing toxin and street drugs and alcohol are just coming up. So without this, the heart failure can come back and come back pretty quickly and very fast enough that it's like acute exacerbation. That means sudden return of the signs and symptoms based on all these factors. Some could be confounding factors. Differential diagnosis of heart failure. So it is possible we have some of the you now physical signs and some of the symptoms on the patient. Now leading us to think this is heart failure, but may not be. So if it's not heart failure, then what can it be? Heart failure differential diagnosis. Might be pneumonia. But you know when you are talking of pneumonia, there must be fever, right? But don't make that mistake in elderly, you may not be fever. Elderly people may have pneumonia, urinary tract infection, have any form of infection without a you know, high temperature. So pneumonia will present with dyspnea, fever, but not in everyone that that fever could be in elderly you may not pick fever. Chronic or surgery pulmonary disease can give us cold pulmonary. Pleural effusion can give this near. Asthma, hmm, breathing difficulty with wheezing. This time it's bronchial asthma, not cardiac asthma. Might be cystic fibrosis that will present like asthma. Tuberculosis will present with hemoptysis. Just as you now the left heart failure will present with utopnia, cough, and hemolysis. Lung cancer can also present with you know, breathing difficulty and hemolysis. Panic attack, sweating profusely, just like someone in heart failure. And anemia can actually cause heart failure symptoms. No palpitations, pallor, you no know, breathing difficulty, and tachypnea, and, and so on. Tyrotoxicosis can present like eye output heart failure with hyperdynamic states. Arrhythmia with palpitations and you know, fainting spells, fatigue and weakness because you know, arrhythmia means the atrium or the ventricle is not actually contracting and pumping. It's actually quivering or fibrillating. Severe hypertension can present in a similar manner. Medications like calcium channel blocker and non serenal inflammatory drugs with or without corticosteroids might be causing fluid retention. And when that is the case, then we have, you know, uh, eye volume, you know, eye, vo eye, eye volume cardiac output. Myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction can present with rupture. A rupture of the valves, then leading to heart failure. Depression, because the weakness, fatigue, tiredness, you no know, anorexia, lack of appetite that we have seen on uh, symptoms earlier can be pointing to depression, might be caused by depression. Venous trouble embolism, because pulmonary embolism can come from DVT, and then venous tumor embolism is a combination of DVT and pulmonary embolism, not presenting like heart failure symptoms, right? And of course, renal failure. Renal failure can cause heart failure. Heart failure can cause renal failure. It's by direction. Liver cirrhosis and liver failure, because when there's right heart failure, there'll be backflow to the spleen, to the liver, then there'll be liver congestion, with jaundice, with you know, liver uh, dysfunction. Then liver function test will show impairment across board with you know, jaundice, bleeding, dyscrasia, and so on. Then the value of PT and APTT will become the rain. The value of the urbane will rise up. There will be ascites and heptomegaly. The next is about prevention of heart failure. Prevention is cheaper. It's cheaper than cure. 
That is, if the situation is curable at all, then the presentation will be incomplete without diving into how to prevent heart failure. Heart failure prevention. You can prevent only what is preventable. That's it. The non-modifiable factors cannot be prevented. And the non-modifiable factors that can lead to obtention of myocardial infarction may eventually lead to heart failure. And these non-modifiable factors are age, the older we become, the more likely to come down with hypertension, myocardial infarction, coronary artery disease, and heart failure. Gen, it is worse in men, but older women, postmenopausal, are running the same risk. Race. Abtention is worse in blacks. Myocardial infarction is worse in whites. Genetics, for the same reason. Abtention is worse in blacks. Myocardial infarction is worse in whites. And heart failure is worse in blacks. Positive family history, for the same purpose. If it's running your family, it's better you run in opposite direction so that you don't mean. The modifiable risk factors are the ones that will be concerned here. I mean, they are the ones that I'm going to address because you can do nothing with the non-modifiable risk factors. Now, the modifiable risk factors. Let there be early detection. Like in class one, where no serious signs, no limitation, not affecting activities of daily living, only having mild symptoms of vagina when they have rigorous exertion. Then if we make that diagnosis at that early stage, we'll be fine. Then we should treat risk factors that we could pick like abstention, Though abstention is not curable, but it could be controlled, like obesity or increased lipid. Let there be change in diet. Let there be exercise. You no, know, your statins. You no, know, ketones in order. My kind of infarction or coronary artery disease, if is ischemia without infarction fully, then there could be reperfusion. Then the situation will be better. Then diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus is not curable, but it could be controlled. No, build good doctor patient relationship. Have your glucose level you no know, estimated appropriately all the time. And then take your medication as prescribed, adjust your diet as prescribed, and then you can die of another cause entirely, not diabetes mellitus or some of its complications like coronary artery disease and then heart failure. There's an energy lifestyle, no more. Please get up, potato couch, get out, get up, get to gym, register yourself, diet. Oh man, oh. Give you pamphlets on the on diet and heart related diseases, then send you to the dietitian, decrease salt consumption, no more smoking, try to quit, please. I'm not blaming you. I'm not no 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 I'm not condemning you in any shape or form. But you no know, for you to enjoy your life, particularly if it's run in your family, you better run the opposite direction. Alcohol, reduce this. Stop boozing all night, all weekends. Now, you might be enjoying it today, but the trouble actually with that failure is so so horrible that imagine you can't even lay flat to sleep and enjoy yourself. No street draws. No, I have so many presentations on street draws. Stop it. No more. 
don't take it, it's going to kill you. And might not kill you so suddenly, you'll be dying gradually and be in serious pain. It's all true. Red meat. Hmm. No, please. John foods, keep them away. Veggies instead, please. Okay. Structural heart defect. You can have surgical repairs if that is a problem. No, there are a lot of experts that can fix that for you. It has led ventricular dysfunction. Well, let's have a go down to pick that. Let's determine the, le the value of the lead ventricular ejection fraction. When that is determined, we can have you no know, early assistance that could be rendered like implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. That could be used. Yeah. And you still be enjoying yourself. And if that is giving you problem you now, you now giving you excessive um, shock, you use a modulum. No so tell her. Cardiotoxic drugs, stop them. You now, for example, hydrocyclines. Now we can have that conversation with your oncologist. You now then they will look for another medication that many conditions right now are being treated or could be treated you now using many different medications is when you have that robust conversation with your you know, attending and uh, pharmacist you will know that not only one drug could be used for you know, one condition if arrhythmia is a problem let's treat it appropriately then let's have lifestyle changes and certain medications withdrawn or electrophysiological ablation particularly in atrial fibrillation, that will help. So where is appropriate? Electrophysiological ablation might you know, be called upon and might be the definitive treatment. Follow up with your doctor, please. Take your prescribed drugs for any disease as it is appropriate. Take your heart failure medications, please, because if you stop not taking your medications, thinking you're feeling well today, then you're going to have acute exacerbation. Right. Stop taking over-the-counter medications indiscriminately. Here, let me pause and really talk to you here. Uh, do you know that non steroid inflammatory drugs can, can, can lead to some of this? And some you know, steroid-laden medications you might be taking can cause all this. So... It's not enough to know what to take. It's another thing to know what can trigger this problem in you if you are already genetically predisposed. Even if you are not genetically predisposed and you are taking all these medications indiscriminately, you no know, smoking, alcohol, no you know, steroids and inflammatory drugs, steroids, some of these chemotherapy agents, no, just like that, and you are getting older and older, then you are driving your uh, car to the house of heart failure. Now, bad medications for heart failure. Many. There are certain medications that we will not want to touch or we will not want to give anyone who has been diagnosed without failure. So let's go through the list so that we'll know what not to take and what to take. Heart failure, drugs to be cautious with. Two more necrosis factor, like emphysema is associated with a new heart failure or was in the existing one if there's one before now. So if you are suspecting that an individual is having heart failure or he or she has been diagnosed with heart failure already, inflicimab would not be appropriate. If inflicimab is prescribed, we will have that meaningful conversation with a physician who has prescribed it. Okay? We, we will be cautious, we'll be careful. Glucocorticoids, for example, fluidocortisone and hydrocortisone. 
they will increase the retention, increase water retention. So except in adrenal insufficiency, we we'll have that conversation with the physician who will prescribe it. non serenal inflammatory are the ibuprofen, so the causing and naproxen. Here they can increase ozone retention, increase peripheral vas vascular constriction, but we need vasodilation when we are dealing with that failure. So we don't need these features here. And then they can lead to decreased response to AC inhibitors and decreased response to diuretics. Why that? When they are retaining the sodium, and sodium is retaining water, you will say your diuretic is not working. It's not so. It's because I can say it going on somewhere. Tephenadine and astemizole, that's second generation anti histamine. They can prolong QT syndrome. Hmm. Let me pause a little bit here. When there's prolonged QT syndrome, that will lead to Tozadi point. Now, going down the hill now, from Tozadi point, that can lead to ventricular tachycardia. Initially monomorphic, but later becoming polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. If there's no correction, that will go down the hill to ventricular fibrillation. If there is no defibrillation, that will lead to asystole. With asystole, you have to call code blue, advanced cardiac life support. If that is not instituted within a few minutes, the patient will end up in the morgue. That is death. So it is that serious. Calcium channel blockers, um, we don't use non diadopyridine calcium channel blocker like verapamine or ditazem around anyone without failure. But even if you are going to use the hydropyridine calcium channel blockers, I'm low dipine and felodipine are favored here. Uh, they have negative inotropy. Then, if you want to use anti arrhythmic agents, you are okay with beta blockers, digocene, and amiodarol. Never use sotalol or ibutila. Minocidine. Minocidine should be used cautiously because it retains sodium, and when any medication can retain sodium, there will be water retention. Metformin. Metformin and its lactic acidosis will be worsened in renal failure and heart failure. Tazolidenin diones. This will retain sodium and retain water, and then it will worsen the heart failure. Silotazol. It is a phosphodiester in the beta. And this can induce exacerbation of heart failure. Carbamazepine can give bradycardia and it has negative anotropic effects. Amphetamines will lead to hypertension, tachycardia, and arrhythmia. All these on their own can cause heart failure. Rosapine, that is a strong second generation antipsychotic. We reserve it to when we cannot get another medication to use. That can give cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, and long QT syndrome. You can pause. I've just explained what can happen with long QT syndrome. Does that point? Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular fibrillation, asystole, and death. Agos will have valvular fibrosis and increased sympathetic activities. Pergolite will give valvular fibrosis. Dicyclic antidepressant will have severe arrhythmias and negative 
inotropic effects. Salbutamol. Salbutamol will decrease potassium and lead to arrhythmia and can lead to increased sympathetic activity. Septra. That is chordimorsism. As a combination of trimetoprene and solvamethosazole. Septra can increase potassium. The same will happen in the face of acute kidney injury with AC inhibitor or ARB, that is angiotensin receptor blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists like spironolactone, or will increase the value of potassium. The traconazole will increase the glycine level because it's an hepatic enzyme inhibitor and then it has negative anotropic effect. Aloperidol or erythromycin, it can prolong the QT. Remember, I've said we prolong QT, that will be tozadipon. So that the point would degenerate to ventricular tachycardia that could be monomorphic initially and then degenerate down to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and from there go down the hill to ventricular fibrillation. If there's no fibrillation on time, then there'll be a systole without code blue being called in advanced cardiac life support stem protocol being instituted, the patient will go from asystole to death and of in the more. So long, uh, prolonged QT to 30 point ventricular tachycardia ventricular fibrillation. The next will be on the treatment of heart failure. Now we have reached a big bus stop. That is the treatment of heart failure. Well, many will likely click on this presentation solely to be able to get the full treatment of heart failure. If that is the purpose, now you are there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go. Treatment of heart failure. Heart failure treatment. First thing first, appropriate position. Patient will sit up at 45 degrees with legs hanging down. But legs will not hang down if there is a potential. Sit up at 45 degrees, legs hanging down if not a potential. Then we go through ABC of treatment. That way, we'll look. The nostrils and the mouth, the ears, we want to find out any secretion, any foreign body, remove the sunshine as is appropriate. Then determine that the airway is patent. We we'll move to the B, that is breathing. We want to see any obvious respiratory distress, turning of other nasal use of accessory respiratory muscles or muscles of respiration, then is the chest moving with the abdomen, any obvious deformity, any deviation of the trachea and to which side. Then central cyanosis or peripheral cyanosis, any finger clubbing if we're able to pick that if we have the time. And then we auscultate for the breath sounds decrease or not after percussion for donors in any part of the precordium. And then we can the respiratory rate. So about O2 size. If it's low, we give oxygen. Nasal cannula, four to six liters or two to six liters as the case might be, depending on the value of O2 size. Okay, then we move to C. So how about the blood pressure, the respiratory rate, the temperature, the vital signs generally, capillary you know, refill, 
then skin toggle for dehydration and of course we want no fluid in and now is the cardiac monitor up what is it reading then ekg right now fluid in and out now of course fluid status the positive airway pressure CPAP or BiPAP. You now we've gotten the o2 side then we're going to give our oxygen as it is appropriate then we'll grab our lasers please try to 200 milligram intravenously depending on the type of you know heart failure we're dealing with then we can have morphine 2.5 milligram intravenously to decrease anxiety and increase venal dilation but we'll be careful depending on the type of heart failure we're dealing with nitroglycerin but we have to check the blood pressure before giving this if the bp is low no nitroglycerin please we have to rule out inferior wall myocardial infarction before we jab with morphine nitroglycerin or beta blockers and also in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and right that failure will be careful with nitroglycerin please including morphine and beta blockers Treat arterial precipitates like myocardial infarction. You can have reperfusion or angioplasty. Arrhythmia, antiarrhythmic agents or real control agents. Treat infections appropriately. Antibodies or antiviral. You can have procalcitonin level to determine if you are dealing with viral or bacterial infection. And if you have already commenced you no know, bacteria. Uh, antibiotics to deal with bacteria procalcitonin will guide whether you are winning or not then anemia once complete blood count is pointed to die with pallor or palpitation you no know, it just transfers as maybe appropriate you know. fluid restriction to two to three liters per day sodium restriction to one to two grams per day and of course, the head of the bed must be elevated. If we are not winning, then we will admit into the intensive care unit. There should be bladder catheterization, to know fluid in and out, and then be able to weigh daily. We have to check blood pressure and rule out cardiogenic shock, or we must be careful and rule out severe pulmonary edema before we can start using Cavedilol. Amildurol, beta blockers or Gigiosine will be helpful in the phase of arrhythmia. Rosemine and metolazone both will give hypokalemia. But if this patient is on AC inhibitors, Beta blockers, angiotensin receptor blockers, and spironolactone are clearly known, or can give apokalemia, including septra. Okay, spironolactone or epirinone. If that is the case, we have to monitor the level of the potassium, and then have our EKG readily available, and then we should be prepared for acute intervention. Why that? When there is apokalemia. We need to get calcium gluconate to avoid cardiotoxic effects of hyperkalemia. And then we can grab our IV fluid, give insulin and glucose to send the potassium back into the cell. And of course, if we are not winning, we can have hemodialysis done. Calculate will not be the first in the face of very high level of potassium. But at the low level, you can have caricillate and then advise against the use of you no know, banana or plantain. Then we can have sabutamol. Sabutamol will also send potassium into the cell. So sodium gluconate, sabutamol, Insulin and glucose, caricillate, depending on the value of the potassium. 
Still on treatment, we will use warfarin if I dealing with atrial fibrillation or left ventricular thrombus is picked on echo. By that, we don't want no dice to uh, throw an embolus and then lead to stroke somewhere or block the renal artery having renal failure or, no, or ischemia. So, choose from the following medications depending on what you are faced with. Intervenous nitroprusine, hydralazine, there's a separate presentation on hydralazine that I've just published. IV laces, there's a separate presentation on laces that I've published long time ago. Dopamine infusion, there's a catecholamine and of course dobutamine infusion. You can also choose for milrinom, cavalua or metoprolol, digocene, ramipri or catopri or perindopri, that's this in Bezos. But if there's of sensitivity to this in Bezos, go for ARB, vasotin, candesatin. And trastol will contain psychobutry and vasotin, but we have to be careful while on entrasto, we'll be careful as per the interpretation of the value of BMP obtained because acupuncture will inhibit the destruction of BMP, meaning BMP level will build up. So we can wrongly assume that we are, we are not winning in someone already on a trust while in the real sense that is not the case. Now, we have used all the medications we can use. We are not winning. Then the patient can have autovitration therapy. The advanced treatment here will include resynchronization therapy with a bioventricular pacemaker. If led ventricular ingestion fraction is less than 35%, or if you are dealing with persistent symptoms, or We've done everything, yet we are not winning. That is failed maximum therapy. If that is the case, then we resolve into a synchronization therapy with a bioventricular pacemaker. Surgical intervention. Implantable cardiovascular defibrillator will prevent sudden cardiac death due to ventricular fibrillation. This is pretty helpful. ICD will prevent sudden cardiac death due to ventricular fibrillation. From the name, implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. This will be useful when there's high suspicions of acute coronary syndrome or there's prior history of myocardial infarction. And also in the face of very low you know, left ventricular ejection fraction as low as less than 30%, then ICD will be helpful. Left ventricular assist device or right ventricular assist device as the case may be. Now, surgical repairs of valves or defects causing or contributing to the heart failure will be helpful. The definitive treatment is cardiac transplantation. This is difficult to do, but uh, suggesting this is not a crime, uh, actually that is the definitive treatment. Get a new heart. I'll give you a new heart, I'll get a new heart. But this is difficult to get. A lot of people are on waiting list. So that is just this. We suggest this. Okay, there's a big question here. When can we discharge this patient? Someone is having a failure, already on treatment. When are we going to be comfortable to say, okay, they are failed to go home? There will be a separate presentation on that, but because you are here to get A to Z on heart failure, I will not deprive you of having that you know, knowledge right now. So let's go through what will be expected before sending this patient home. Number one, 
we must be sure that follow-up cleaning is uh, feasible. That means is what could be done, you know, and it is accessible to this patient. For example, somebody has no one to bring him or her back to the family physician for follow-up, then if that arrangement is not there, the family physician is aware, the patient you know, knows how to get the family physician. If that is not fixed, we are not sending this patient home. Then we must fully educate the patient and the family members that this is a chronic disease. You do this, you do this, you do that. You weigh, you get medication. And when this and this you know, are showing up, you call 911. Then we need to do echo to determine the left ventricular ejection fraction so that if the left ventricular ejection fraction is pretty low, we will not discharge this patient right now. We will make sure implantable cardioverter defibrillator is in place before sending her home. If not, she will mean untimely death. If the left ventricular ejection fraction is low, then we must place this patient on certain medications like beta blockers and AC inhibitors. If severely low, I mean, if the left, venti uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is severely low, then we go for implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. Volume deficit should be fully corrected and we'll make sure that this patient is stable before we can send him or her out of you know, the hospital. No more intravenous medications. I mean, I'm not saying you must not give intravenous medications, but we cannot send this patient out of the hospital into the community if he or she is still on irregular intravenous medications. No. We must make sure that this patient can take part or and then we will help this patient and the family better after fully educating them that these are the triggers identified in this person and that should be fully addressed. Then we will do our part by going through what is helpful in solving this problem in this very patient because each case is different, right? As per lifestyle changes. And that should be fully addressed. And then we'll admonish, we will, you know, advise. We cannot catch up. We cannot, you know, allow anybody to do anything. Okay? Number one, diet. Okay? Salt intake should be reduced. Alcohol. No, you can call it. Smoking, there be cessation. Exercise as could be tolerated. Then we make sure that she should be weighing scale to weigh. And then phone is available to call 911. Then means of transportation is available. Now, for example, somebody has a failure, has been transported from the rural area to the city for treatment. And now we want to discharge the same patient to go back to the rural area where they cannot access, you know, healthcare facilities in the next two to four hours. So that, that, that would be pretty risky, right? Social welfare could be involved if there is social welfare related issues like financial issues and then maybe family disharmony or whatever. So just briefly saying when all those things are in place then we can say okay it's time to go home now the prognosis and failure prognostic factors many people will die from ventricular fibrillation and that is the most cause of sudden death. Progressive pump failure will lead to deterioration by the day. Finally, the heart will be dead. That is from progressive pump failure. The individual will be deteriorating 
gradually going down the hill by the day until the heart will stop. Remember where I started from. I said the heart is fed. It will continue to fail in some people until it will finally cease. Exercise intolerance is the primary predictor of mortality and morbidity. Good prognosis. If somebody is young, remember we said that BMP could be high, but the individual is not showing full symptoms of signs and symptoms of heart failure because they are young, no ischemia and no cardiomyopathy, female gender, no arrhythmia associated, no cardiomyopathy, absence of hemochromatosis or amyloidosis, absence of HIV infection, surgical repairs or surgically related heart problems is possible, availability of the following medications and complying with them will help like easy and beta, Sacobutri and Vasatan as a tresto, Cafedilor and Spironolactum, but watch out for the potassium level. Availability of resources for resynchronization and ventricular assist devices and transplantation. When all these things are associated with a particular patient, that's a good prognosis, meaning he or she will not likely be killed by these effects. Now, the poor prognosis. This is what we don't want to hear. Hospitalization for heart failure is a bad prognosis. Increased age, the older will become, the worse, the heart failure, the older, the more, the probability of heart failure. May gender is bad. I should tell diabetes mellitus, S3 gal. Left ventricular ejection fraction decrease below 45%. Decrease sodium concentration. Serum urea greater than 15 millimoles per liter is a bad prognosis. It means the kidney is in trouble when the kidney is also greater than 2.7 million per DL. Systolic blood pressure less than 110 millimeters of mercury is a bad news. Anti pro BMP greater than 986 picogram per mil is not good. Increased pulmonary artery capillary wedge pressure is a bad news. So, all these are pointing to poor prognosis. The prognosis will be poor when there's a shit arrhythmia like atrial fibrillation or ventricular fibrillation. When there's cardiomyopathy or presence of autoimmune conditions like amyloidosis, the prognosis is poor. Why that? They are difficult to, to treat, they are difficult to handle. Genetic or secondary hemochromatosis, the use of dosorubicin. Dosorubicin should not be part of poor prognosis. You just stop it and change to another you know, uh, capable medication. Presence of HIV infection because you can cure it. Now, finally, after two hours, 37 minutes, I can now conclude that when there's heart failure, there's a way out. But the best thing is we know early, then we act early. And wishing other affected people well. After listening to the entire presentation from A to Z, you have less question or questions to ask anyone. Thank you for listening. Please, first thing first. After listening, educate someone around you. Send this to everybody, to people working along the street, to nurses, nursing students, to physicians, medical students. Let's help human race. Thanks for listening. Remember to share this. Remember to subscribe to my channel if you haven't. I appreciate it.